Hi, can you hear me? Hi, and oh, sorry, you can. I need to Hello. be able to share my screen. Okay. If you can enable that. And how do we know you're sharing screen? Uh, okay. We're just organizing that for you now, Michael. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think we can. Okay, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So my name is Michael Sladnik. I'm from Chicago. And uh, last year I moved over to the Thai Myanmar border area. I'm currently in the Miawadi area. That's where there's been big battles happening the last few months for uh, control of the city, the regime being pushed back and trying to counterattack. So I got involved in the revolution over there and have been active here. And tonight, I want to talk a little bit about a recent trip I took to another nearby border area to Kareni, which is an area uh, that is close to liberation. So we visited a lot of the uh, current battlefronts and liberated areas. I went there with a journalist. I organized between them the, the local revolutionaries and translated for them. So before I talk about that, I have a lot to say about the spring revolution in general and a little bit about my involvement over the past three years. So uh, let me just start this. So I was a leftist for a long time in the US and I became a leftist because I believe that this wave of globalization that was happening over the last decades was building up these dictatorships around the world, but also industrializing and creating a new international working classes around the world. And that we had to look forward to their uprisings and prepare for them. Uh, so I was always following different revolutions happening around the world. And when the coup happened in Myanmar, you know, I didn't really expect much of it because I knew that this was a country that had repeated a revolutions which are crushed and finally achieved a very weak democracy which you know had a genocide uh, and very little pushback against that genocide so you know I had no connection with Myanmar I'd never been there uh, I didn't know any Burmese people but I did not think that this would succeed and the past revolutions were started by students or the one in 2007 by monks and this one got started differently. It started with the public sector workers here, teachers. They, a few days after the coup, they went on strike against it. Other public sector workers here, medical workers, train workers, public employees, all said they're not gonna work under the coup regime. And then this spread to the factories. So the decade of semi-democracy in Myanmar, so all this export oriented garment and other low wage labor factories staffed largely by migrants from the countryside, from the villages. Myanmar is still predominantly a rural country. So these largely female migrant workforce, they started to protest against the coup. Meetings were happening and they decided to join the strike against it. And they really built, they, it was from these factories that they built a general strike. They pushed for a general strike. And that's how by the middle of February, mass protests grew out of this this working class movement. And in Yangon and other big cities, you saw the immense demonstrations break out. So the regime, the military dictatorship tried to crack down and people fought back bravely. You know, this is one of the largest militaries in the world and people in the cities did everything they can to fight back. Uh, they built barricades in different cities to prepare to confront the police and the soldiers and you know, led the resistance from those barricades, defending the protests with homemade weapons like these. You know, the so the protests kept going on and uh, starting to arm themselves. And they knew that the time was urgent. So at the same time as the protests were continuing, they're pushing to spread the revolution. The three finger salute that came from Thailand protests for the year before. So they were trying to spread this into an Asian spring. 
And here you see protesters marching. That's the Chinese border gate trying to spread the protest for democracy to China. So the regime eventually cracked down to this. They upped their force. They cracked down brutally using real ammunition, shooting into the crowd, shooting at the barricades, blowing them up with bombs. And many martyrs were lost. You know, people, these young people, this generation who had vowed to fight for democracy lost thousands of people. You know, this was all within a two month, month period, you see from having a normal life to protesting, to being on the barricades, to being a martyr. And in particular, they cracked down on the factory district, Hlengthea in Yangon. They slaughtered hundreds of these shop floor union activists, especially women, you know, factory activists. And it seemed at that point like the revolution could be defeated. That was at the point when the mass media, Myanmar basically mostly dropped out of the headlines. And in the past, these past revolutions, the regime had cracked down like that and the revolution had been defeated. You had some people like in 1988, starting to go up to the hills to try to fight back. But that might have been it, just a small number of people going to join fighting the hills. But this time was different. Myanmar had changed a lot. And just as it was falling out of the headlines and uh, you know the urban movement was facing oppression, an even, even larger and more powerful movement was just beginning. And you know, throughout, as the crackdown is happening in the cities, people are flowing out of them, hundreds of thousands of people, this migrant rural workforce is going back to their villages, these women factory workers and other activists, and they're starting to mobilize the population there. So, you know, you could see here, these, these women activists leading in the cities, people saw this as themselves. They were, they were their sisters, their brothers, their cousins, their friends who were in the cities leading this protest. And there was a huge explosion of anger when that crackdown happened on the, the working class in the cities. And meetings started to be held. And this erupted into huge mass movement. So, you know, the rural areas of Myanmar had sat out of all past revolutions. They had not participated. And this time, when the regime tried to crack down, they sparked for the first time in Myanmar's history, this huge upheaval of the masses in the, in the countryside. Um, and you had in these quiet little towns where nothing ever happens, you know, that no one has ever heard about and no one visited, huge demonstrations breaking out everywhere. You know, so this is as things were already, you know, being crushed in the cities. And the mobilization to this went down to every village in the country. It went down all the way to the grassroots. And, you know, these people from every village, they had working class, everyone on the Internet. So they were all plugged into what was happening this time. And it spread to the minority areas. You know, Myanmar is dozens of different ethnic groups. And this, the protests, even after the urban crackdown, you saw in all these minority areas, people still protesting, still rising up where they could. And even there, you know, it was the working class that was at the head of this movement. These women and other, you know, people with experience in the factories, uh, in the urban protests were coming back to the countryside and leading the protest there, leading it in the small towns. And teachers, you know, also urban rural teachers unions, teachers, the, the civil disobedience movement strike said that they're going to refuse to work under the regime. They spread to those areas. And students, most students across the country also stopped attending classes from kindergarten through university and up to the present day, that is still the case. You know, a lot of, a lot of other areas that had some industry, like here, miners, they were centers of this uprising and that swept across the countryside. So this was a really liberating moment. Uh, you know, that the world was was missing. They weren't, they had stopped paying attention to Myanmar, but there was this movement of these people who had never fought back before for the first time standing on their feet and saying they're not going to, they're not going to go back to dictatorship. And it was at this time that I really realized that something historic was happening here. This was not just another movement that was going to, you know, pop up with all this hope and expectation and then get crushed and disappear. People uh, where, you know, I was already starting to meet people from Myanmar on Facebook, everyone's on Facebook, and they were saying, you know, we have history of this, 
we have had many failed revolutions, so we know what it's going to take. It means to fight against the military. It's not going to be easy, but this time we can't give up. We're going to fight. So, you know, is it this time that I really said I got to find some way to support them? You know, whatever that takes. And the regime started to crack down on these rural protests too. But when they did, people fought back. They started to assemble. You know, thousands of of groups or all over in different areas, thousands of self-organized autonomous groups getting together, young people, a whole generation of young people with no arms, starting to make homemade bombs, homemade guns, training themselves to fight back. And you could see here, so, you know, just as the world was ignoring Myanmar and the middle class and the rich who hated the coup, you know, were giving up and feeling hopeless. You had this rural proletariat, this Gen Z, flocking to the banner of the revolution, saying they're going to fight for it and, you know, going with whatever homemade weapons they have to fight it. And you could see what type of people they, these were who were fighting, what type of guns they have. This is one of the, you know, the captured from one of the first big battles in the middle of the country, this heartland of the uprising. You know, normal people, men and women, these are, you know, PDF, People's Defense Forces taken a prisoner of war. They're regularly tortured in prison. And the regime releases these pictures. They have, they don't care about public image. You know, they release picture of this of captives giving a three finger salute. They don't expect you to consent to the rule. They don't have propaganda. You just have to submit. So despite losing many people, despite that not having weapons to fight back, the resistance took over a large area of the country. And you can see this map, the red and the blue areas controlled by resistance forces and ethnic insurrection. In fact, the red area should be much larger. The resistance controls most of the countryside. It's just very difficult to map. So even, you know, this is my wife here. She was uh, working in Yangon at the time. And, you know, when there was the fight back in her native area was successful, she went back. She had confidence. She wanted to fight the regime. And you had a new wave of people going back, giving up their careers, going to fight. You had other people going up to the borderlands, the jungles, to join the ethnic minority groups. And the ethnic minority armies expressing confidence in the revolution, saying they're going to fight on the side of it. They're going to put their future in it. And that resistance kept the protest movement going, the civil protests in, in the countryside. In any area where they're able to organize, they kept protesting. So it wasn't just an armed struggle. You had demonstrations continuing every single day all over Myanmar for months and months after it disappeared from the headlines and the urban protests were crushed. And these were organized by strike committees, totally self-organized, no one directing them all over in local areas. Uh, you know, young generation of people and, you know, giving speeches every day, organizing protests, rallying, you know, their support for the revolution and, you know, organizing, mobilizing the communities as part of it. You had, you know, people who experienced with the unions continuing to be active in that. And their message they were trying to put out, these protests, was one of that this revolution was a consequence of Myanmar's history to fail. When the regime was oppressing, the military was oppressing all these different ethnic groups, Burmese people, the dominant group had failed to stand up for it. So you had this idea that this now the regime was oppressing everyone because they failed to stand up for the oppressed. So a lot of these protests, their themes were, you know, liberation, support for the oppressed. And in the heartland of the country, there's not many ethnic and religious minorities, but, you know, LGBT in these rural areas were very prominent of standing at the head of demonstrations and, you know, in rural areas, mining districts, solidarity demonstrations with LGBT, with women's rights, other groups, you know, dressing children in drag as a show of respect. Some of the people dressed like that are also, you know, LGBT themselves. And these protests were a safe haven from activists from the cities who wanted to keep doing the above ground protests, keep doing protests, able to go there and spread their message. So, you know, I dedicated myself to trying to support the this these people who kept doing the protests. Man, Burmese people all over the world were fundraising, crowdfunding to support the resistance. And, you know, I felt that the civil resistance was also really important, not just the armed resistance. 
And uh, I spent, you know, every day for months and months and eventually started to make contact with these people, these activists for, who were leading these demonstrations around the country. And, you know, I, most of them don't speak English. So I had to learn Burmese in the process of, of, meeting, of supporting them and raising funds for them. Because you had all these young people, you know, they're not part of any organization. There's no one directing them. And they're often from the poorest parts of the country, the poorest elements from their village. They're the young people who stood up in this revolution, dedicated themselves to it, were rising up as young, you know, proletarian grassroots leaders. So these people need support. You know, the, the middle class, the richer people in Myanmar were afraid to support them, afraid to donate, they can get arrested. So as an international supporter, I saw, my, you know, if I don't support them to keep doing this revolution, then what support will they get? And also, you know, small number of people who bravely kept doing protests in the cities, you know, donating to them so they can have safe houses and continue to be active there. So this area I was talking about, I was focusing in my online work. That's this area in red in the middle of the country, Anya. And I was especially focusing on the black circle within that where a lot of the protests were happening. And by mid-2023, my Burmese was good enough just from doing that work and talking to them every day online that I wanted to come to the region and do more. You know, I really felt lucky to be able to meet these people, know these incredible people, to support them. So I came down to that green area down there, the Thai Myanmar borderland, to try to work with activists from the ground. And my trip I'm going to tell you about now is in this blue area in the middle, another borderland area, uh, Kareni. Uh, you know, that I, that I took a journalist to who is very active on bringing news about the ongoing resistance gains against the military on Twitter. And he wanted to report from the actual situation on the ground so people on Twitter can know about that, uh, you know, can get the actual insight from the people. So Kareni is a lot like the area that I had experience with. It is an area which is one of the centers of the mass movement in 2021. These mass protests erupted. And, you know, unlike the other pictures I showed you of, which were from Burmese, Bamar ethnic areas, Kourani is very multi-ethnic, very uh, diverse, different ethnic groups, different religions, many different languages. But it was another center of this protest movement. And it was also the first area where people really started to fight back, where the regime focused on them at the beginning and tried to crack down. And here you see them destroying a police station and they fight back. They fought back in like, you know, May, June 2021 against that crackdown with whatever homemade weapons they have organizing across ethnic lines uh, as part of the spring revolution to fight back. So, you know, despite that difficult starting point of not having arms, now you see the map here. They've almost completely liberated Kareni. Uh, there's only a few regime holdouts left remaining. So we wanted to go there and see what the situation is. And Kareni, it's an extremely beautiful landscape. Uh, but after three years of revolution, it's been devastating. There's destruction, ruins everywhere. You see here cities, the regime uh, specifically targets, you know, civilian areas, driveway civilians, trying to punish them for doing the revolution. It's being pushed back by the resistance and takes it out on civilians. And in the rural areas as well, you know, there's not a single village in all of Kareni State that has not been bombed. Everywhere we went, ruins, burned down villages, destruction everywhere. And the people of Kareni are relegated to, largely relegated to refugee camps, hiding in ravines women, children, the elderly. So these refugee camps, people, even if their areas have been liberated, they can't return to them. When the regime was occupying their areas, they planted bombs in their housing. So when people come back, they're blown up. They continue to target them with drone strikes, to terrorize the civilians. And the land is all fallow. They don't have support support to come back and reestablish uh, their economy and start living again. On the Thai side of the border here, we saw huge, enormous abandoned refugee camps where tens of thousands of Kareni people have been. 
and the Thai government forced these people back across the border into the fire zone with no assistance. Uh, you know, internet is cut off on these areas. They, there's very few news reports out about what's happening. They have difficulty even contacting other Burmese people for support. So you have people living in these shelters. They don't even have proper rain covers. That's not waterproof. Uh, with the monsoon season a, a few months away, all they have to eat is rice, no cooking oil, no onions, uh, nothing to protect them from the rains, not even malaria medicine, you know, for when they get sick. And it was this, these people who have sacrificed everything for democracy through their own efforts, despite not getting support, they have fought back and taken control of current of most of Kareni, liberated most of it. The, you know, sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers of the people in the camps are the ones on the front lines fighting. And they're doing their best to support the refugees at the same time as they're dependent on the civilian population for support. It's, you know, a real, uh, there's many different groups. They all have to fund, crowd fund for themselves. They're all dependent on local contributions. So you see here, fighting in urban battlefields, they just have flip-flops. They can't even afford shoes, real uh, uniforms. Despite that, they've, you know, continued to make major gains. So here in Messe in the South, uh, Messe police station, which was liberated a few months ago. It was the last holdout of the regime in the south of the state. Uh, and PDFs, you know, besieged it and took it over a few months ago to liberate the southern area. Over 20 police died in the battle. Their uniforms and their bulletproof vests are still in the rubble and turned at least the south of Kareni into a refuge for these civilians. So here, we visited a mountain camp of the regime that was just taken a few weeks before we arrived. Uh, almost 100 regime soldiers died there in the capture. The, P the PDFs, the revolutionaries, successfully captured it. In the, the past, their corpses were still laying on the ground. In the last picture, you can kind of see one. Uh, and there, the commander's corpse, you know, a lieutenant commander, that's his badge, came from him. So the regime is suffering major losses. That's the second last camp the regime holds in the mountains. Now the PDF is moving on to the last one. Uh, here, you know, with the with this lack of support, they have the whole population trying to fight back, but they have major limitations. So here, a major bridge they just captured also a few weeks before we arrived. And when they use the guns and ammunition they have to take those, every battle they face, because they don't have outside support, after they take a position, they have to stockpile, spend a long time stockpiling ammunition before they're ready for the next battle to assault the next point. And in the meantime, have to expend all these resources to feed everybody, to care for the refugees. And you know, everyone kept saying, if they just got outside support these last few battles, to be over immediately. They just don't have enough ammunition to finish it. Uh, so, you know, how it was there, the way these groups are organized is every, everywhere we went, every different base we visited, every camp had multiple different groups, like four or five different groups sharing one base. And these are people from all different areas, all different languages. So in addition, the Kareni ethnic group is like, 10 or 12 different groups. They all speak different languages. In addition to that, there's many Shan people in Kareni that's related to Thai. There's Burmese people. There are Karen people. Uh, so a very diverse area, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists. And they're all organized these, in these different groups. And everywhere we visited had many different groups working together. Um, you know, under the chain of command, under the NUG's chain of command, but not really receiving any support from the NUG. All these battles I just showed you, the police station, the bridge, they took that with their own resources, not with NUG money. So they loyal to the NUG, but the NUG has no one there, no officials to control them. These are just normal people who are organizing to fight back and organize into all these different groups, but coordinating, all working together. So sharing drones, 
drones, a lot of them they built themselves are very important for these battles to give them a fighting chance. All these different groups, different ethnic groups share drones together. Here's from a cooking camp. They share single cooking camps, um, places cooking for all the different groups. Um, and, you know, also bringing in, this is from a, uh, a regime base that defected a few months ago. We stayed there at night. So the soldiers joined, uh, you can see they're pointing in the guest house, men on lines picture, still on the walls there. Visiting there was the one time going into that, I was a little afraid on the trip, but here, a soldier who defected from the military dictatorship to the base who let us in. He has three sons fighting, all fighting in the resistance. So when I heard that, you know, I was more at ease. Um, and different EAOs here, KNPLF, that was kind of a regime, a EAO, an ethnic armed insurgent group, which had had an agreement for decades with the regime. Just a few months ago, they joined, they went over to the side of the revolution. And there we saw them all working together with the PDFs. So, you know, the form of organization that we saw that, you know, that I have also experienced working with the middle of the country, these areas with the other resistance and the protests, is there's a symbolic belief in a democratic government, the NUG. But the NUG doesn't really do anything. Uh, it does, it's not funding these groups, it's not controlling them. So people just have a symbolic belief in democracy and democratic values. And with that belief uh, and that dedication to fight back, they're able to organize themselves in all, into all these dozens and hundreds of thousands of autonomous groups, which have their self-organization, but are all able to cooperate with each other because they are all dedicated to democracy and social justice. And you know, everyone we talk to that said, that's what we're fighting for. We're not fighting for this to get anything for ourselves. We just want our rights back. And we're not just fighting for Kareni. After Kareni, we're going to go on and fight for Napidao, for the capital, with the regime capital, which is nearby Kareni, and that this is part of a global struggle against fascism. So there's me in Pasong, which is a major city where the battles are happening now able to go up right to the front lines. The regime is surrounded, the siege in their last base there. There's me again in the village with some PDF uh, the, at the Messe police station. And yeah, that's the journalist we took who was doing the reporting from there. You see displaying the regime flag, the hated uh, Myanmar dictatorship flag of the old fake, fake democratic constitution. So, you know, I believe that this is a, you know, these people are on the front lines of a gro global struggle against dictatorship, against the rising forces of fascism. And it's important for us to support them. They need the left support. There's nobody else helping these people. And even, you know, people who have better jobs, who have money, who are wealthy in Myanmar are afraid to support them. So it's the working class people and the poor who are on their own. For the past three plus years, no government, no NGO has helped them. Uh, and they are just, you know, dependent on their, if they got that help, they would make the biggest difference. They kept saying over and over again, if they just had a little more money to buy ammunition, then they would really be able to liberate Kareni for people fleeing the military draft who are starting to arrive or all different ethnic groups and turn into a base to bring this revolution to the next level. So, you know, I encourage people to do what you can to support the Myanmar Spring Revolution. And, you know, I did it by meeting my local Myanmar community, uh, Myanmar people all over the world. They're the ones who are funding this and keeping the struggle going. So talk to Myanmar people at that meeting and from wherever you're from about how to get involved. and. You know, if you would like another way to donate, you can go to this Facebook page. We are doing a, a campaign to raise that support for Kareni, right directly for the people on the front lines we met. And it's been a very difficult last month here since I returned uh, in the Karen state, the Miawadi area. The resistance temporarily liberated the city and then had to retreat because there's a huge armored regime reinforcement column, which is still coming. So 
uh, you know, we've been occupied here, but we are still launching that support campaign and continuing support for the strike committees and everyone else. So again, this is a very powerful revolution and I'm constantly dumbfounded by the lack of attention it's getting from the mainstream media and from activists around the world. So I'm very thankful for all of you who attended here today who are showing interest and, and support of Myanmar. And I'm th thank you all for the opportunity for me to speak and for listening to me. It's so much Thank you so much. My name is Katrina here. I'm at House Conspiracy, which is an organizing space here in Brisbane. And uh, we've got a, a, a really beautiful group of activists here who have listened um, and really taken on more what you said. So thank you so much.